<laughs> if you want to learn physics, Feynman wrote the book. Uh, just read the damn book. It's all there. I really believe that the connection to other humans on any learning track becomes really, really, really important. I like to be on a team. I like ambitious goals. I like thinking through how we can anticipate the future. Rise and shine, it's Espresso time. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I am not a morning person. I'm not, but when you start your day off with a powerful routine that inspires you for success, like watching one of these videos, it will change your life. So let's start your day off right together. Grab your coffee, know that I believe in you, and get ready for a shot of Espresso from Bill Gates. I wake up every morning. Espresso, keep me going. The number of students who can learn without a social setting around it is very, very small. Uh, you know, if you want to learn computer science, just, you know, Knuth wrote the book, buy it, okay. Uh, you know, read it and do the problems for if you really think you know this thing. If you want to learn physics, Feynman wrote the book. Uh, just read the damn book. It's all there. So that when we put stuff online, it, we don't have anything in online physics that's any better than Feynman's book, honest, honestly. Now, it's a little easier to learn. Uh, you know, the guy makes jokes every 20 minutes, or at least tries to, uh, <laughs> and he does more demos and things. So learning is a weird social phenomena. And so, you know, our foundation, our big problem is that the group that does the worst with online learning are low-income students because their notion of why am I learning, their sense of self-confidence, the ability to figure out, oh, I just got stuck because you know, two minuses cancel out and I, I never saw that notation before. They just hit dead ends all the time that if you're sitting in your dorm at Stanford, you know, somebody walks down and uh, helps you get through it. This clip is so powerful, is so important, at least for me, that I rewound it a couple times, emailed myself, and wrote down word for word what Bill Gates said. The first line of the clip was, the number of students who can learn without a social setting around it is very, very small. I think that is easy to skip over, but I think it's really at the core of why people are not picking up the skills they need to. Why you, as an entrepreneur, you're probably not achieving what you could because you don't have the social setting around it. And it's very powerful for me. Let's go on this little side story because I wanna solve the world's biggest problem. People don't believe in themselves. I wanna teach people how to believe in themselves more. And I think that little aspect there of the social dynamic and social structure is really important. When I started Movement Makers, where I train thought leaders and entrepreneurs how to get their message out. You got a big message inside you, I wanna see it get out to the world. At the beginning, it was just me presenting. It was me taking 85 minutes every two weeks. You guys pick a topic, people voted in Facebook what they wanted me to talk about, and I would talk about it for 85 minutes. I started to see such amazing connections between people that I realized I don't wanna be the go-between because it's limiting, because I have to know what everybody's up to and when, where they're from and what they're trying to do. And as we've grown movement makers, I can't know what everybody's exactly working on right now. So we created breakout sessions where you get to meet other people in the room. And as an introvert and someone who's shy, that, is, that sounds terrifying to me. I hate the idea of breakout rooms. I'm gonna be put in a room of people that I don't know who they are and be, be asked to talk about something that I, even just thinking about it terrifies me. And so the fact that I would do that to the people, you know, who, who pay me to be part of their program uh, makes me worried that I would disappoint them. But it ended up being one of the greatest things that we do because the more you can feel like you're connected to other people, that you're learning together, that you're not on this journey alone, the more likely you are to actually follow through. That community aspect that we built in that just felt intuitively right from the feedback that we were getting, I think is actually a cornerstone for how people should lead any kind of education or training. You could think about that for your own training, for you as a human, like how do you stay consistent on something? Well, if you're doing it with somebody else, you're way more likely to follow through. Or think about it for the training that you're leading. 
is there a way to make it a community vibe so that other people are connected to each other and they'll be more likely to follow through. We are probably the most optimistic, positive people that we know. Right? If you're watching this video, you care about your self-growth, you've been on a journey, you've come through some pretty hard things and you're here now and you're still standing and you're ready to go and build something bigger for yourself, right? That's why you're here, Believe Nation. Come on, let's go. That's why we watch these videos. We're trying to grow, learn, improve, get better. And you're probably the most positive person that you know. And that's amazing. And you're pouring into other people. And yet there's nobody doing that for you. People are, are coming to you for advice and wisdom and guidance and support and, and an ear to you know, listen to their problems, but who's doing that for you? And I think that's one of the big reasons why most people don't follow through. And I've, I've defaulted, I'm thinking out loud here as I go on this video. This is a lot of personal reflection on that one comment. I've defaulted to environment, which I think is super important with videos like this, um, with books and podcasts. And I, I genuinely believe that if you watch one of these videos every day, it will shift your mindset forward. It will shift your learning forward. Even though you may never meet me, you may never meet Bill Gates, you may never meet these people, you're still hanging around them and you're still learning and they're pulling you towards success. If you watch a video from some of your heroes every single day, you may not notice a shift on a day-to-day -day basis, but you look back weeks, months, even years later and say, wow, I'm, I've, I think differently. I have more confidence. I have more courage. I have more self-belief. You, you still aren't going to be where you want to be. And newsflash, you always want growth. So you never want to be stuck where you are. You always want growth. That's, that's part of the human condition. That's amazing. And you've come a long way from where you used to be. And so I think the environment really plays a part of that. And I really believe that the connection to other humans on any learning track becomes really, really, really important. And I'm honestly trying to figure out how could I do that more with the YouTube community, with you guys. You know, Inside Movie Makers, it's, it's pretty solid. You get introduced to other people in the group. Even before you join the first meeting, you're probably going to be connected to somebody else in the group to have a conversation inside the group where it's a, it's a dance party at the beginning. You're meeting people. Uh, you're going to be put into breakout rooms. You're learning together. We have challenges that we do. There's a lot of interconnectivity. And I think that's probably one of the biggest reasons why people stick is they get to meet other people who are like them. If you feel like you're a weird duck and nobody else around you is like you, well, now you get to be in a room of people who are like you. And automatically, even if the, even if the topic of the day isn't as relevant or valuable to you and what you're facing right now, just being around other achievers, other optimistic, bright, positive people makes a difference. Will change how you show up for the rest of your day, week, month, etc. But I don't know how to do it yet on, a, on the YouTube side of things. I don't know how to help you guys as much beyond, hey, I always say, leave a comment below. Tell me how you're going to apply the lessons in this video. Encourage each other. Um, it, it really just makes me think, what else could we do to make the learning more community guided? more community focused because at the end of the day, if I really want to solve the world's biggest problem, you know, people don't believe themselves enough, the more we could put the world on a believe curriculum together and create that community, I think we'll get a lot more results. I think, I think we've all felt the challenge and hurdle and struggle of trying to do everything on our, on our own. I look at my own career, my own journey. Every time I tried to do something by myself, I always struggled. But whenever I had a model to follow or a mentor to guide me, I did better. And I think as we continue on this journey together, hopefully you've grown a lot. If you're still you know, watching this video and subscribe to this channel, I appreciate you. And definitely open to ideas on how to make it even more community guided, community focused. How do we put the world on a believe curriculum that we could do together. It's, it's some good food for thought. Most of the time when I'm doing the videos here, I'm sharing my thoughts and giving you challenges. This one is a different vibe. This one is, is uh, challenging me to think as well, which is why I love this content, right? If I didn't have this channel, I wouldn't have been exposed to this video, would have made me think and have this moment with you guys here today. So uh, instead of our usual question of the day, I love to know your thoughts. How do we spread more belief? How do we make the community even stronger? How do we get everybody on a on a belief training curriculum so that you feel like you're not alone every day in trying to show up and chase down your dreams? Any feedback, suggestions, comments, 
hot takes. I'd love to see them down in the comments below. Also, if you want to have more self-confidence and self-belief, the science says it can take up to 254 days of consecutive action for the habit to stick. That's what I want for you. So I've designed a custom free program where I'm going to send you an unlisted video for the next 254 days to shift your confidence and belief forward. The link to join is in the description below. You really have to believe the internet's going to be mainstream. A lot of people are going to get out there and use it. When you have the level of success that we've had, when you have a business that's important as this with this many competitors, you're going to have people saying some nasty things. If you ask people across the United States, is the future going to be better than the past? Most say no. You know, you can over worship and mythologize the idea of working extremely hard. For my particular makeup, I mean, it really is true that I didn't believe in weekends, I didn't believe in vacations. I mean, you know, I knew everybody's license plate, so I could tell you over the last month when their car had come and gone from the, the parking lot. <laughs> it, it, so I don't recommend it. A, I don't think most people would enjoy it. Uh, once I got into my 30s, I could hardly even imagine how I had done that. Uh, because by then, some natural behavior kicked in, and I loved weekends, and uh, you know, my girlfriend liked vacations, and that turned out to be kind of a neat thing. Uh, <laughs> now I take lots of vacations. I mean, my 20-year-old self is so disgusted with my uh, current uh, uh, self. You know, I, I was sure I would never do anything but ride and coach. You know, now I have a plane. So it's, it's <laughs> very much counter-revelations have taken place at, at high speed. But yes, it is nice if during those first several years, if you have a team that's chosen to be pretty maniacal about the company. And how far that goes, you, you know, should have a mutual understanding so you're not uh, one person expecting one thing, another person expecting another thing. And you'll have individuals who, who have, you know, health or relatives or things that are distracted. But yes, I have a fairly hardcore view that there should be a very large uh, sacrifice made during those, those early years. Today, people come to you all the time for money, I assume. Everywhere you go, people say, by the way, I have this thing you should invest in. But I have a couple myself I'll mention later. No, not just kidding. No, a couple of things you should invest in or things you should give money to. So how do you resist it? You have some person who says no for you, or how do you do that? Let many people. Uh, many people say no. Well, once you've picked what you care about, if somebody has something that can make a difference in global health, we're super interested. And you know, we have a staff of 1,500 people, and if it's to do with global health, some of those people will come out and talk through with you whatever your innovation is and how we can partner with you on that. Okay. You know, so that's clearly in our area. If it is something that can substantially improve K through 12 education, then we're going to be very interested in it. If people are asking outside of those things, then you know, fortunately, you can say no because focus is, is key to philanthropy. The digital revolution, internet, social media, all of that, in certain respects, it's made it easier for us to see what's going on. Medical researchers are publishing articles every day, and all over the world, people can immediately see what the new thinking is there. Tracking the disease statistics, I click on the John Hopkins website every morning and see, okay, which countries are having a tough time with cases or, or deaths. Thank God for the internet. Work at home, you know, our ability to connect up with each other is driven by that. But it also has meant that a lot of very surprisingly interesting conspiracy theories that are false, sadly, they spread a lot faster than the truth. You know, so the idea that did somebody intentionally cause this thing, completely false, even in some cases accusing me of having some connection, that can be dangerous because it means, you know, your willingness to believe is the vaccine something I should take? Should I wear masks? You know, if you go for these simple but wrong theories, getting people to work together and protect each other so we can get out of this as soon as possible, that's really at risk. You raise the question of how should the government deal with that? It's very difficult. Ideally, citizens are just well-informed and they know which publications are very careful about what they say and we don't have to engage in censorship. But so much of the 
almost crazy false information is out there that looking at the companies like Facebook and saying, okay, what is their role in that? You know, when somebody says masks don't work, which is wrong, or they say, just take hydroxychloroquine and you'll be totally safe. What is their responsibility for catching those things, particularly when they get up to large numbers? That is being debated. And, you know, I think we'll come out of this with those companies feeling a stronger sense of responsibility and actually understanding having the public debate about uh, how they need to help here. You really have to believe the internet's going to be mainstream. A lot of people are going to get out there and use it and that they're going to be willing to pay for some content. Is that the operating idea that you have? Well, each of these businesses uh, is an entrepreneurial business. Uh, the overreaching theme is that, yes, I believe in the internet. I believe it'll get increasingly popular. And we're doing some neat new things to take advantage of that. Is part, you've got a lot of cash on hand, yes? Right. All right. <laughs> it puts you in an enviable position. You can experiment with a lot of entrepreneurial ideas and see what sticks and what flies. Well, we're, we're in business to make money. And but the other thing is providing such a cash flow for you. Well, it, it all belongs to the shareholders. Yeah. Uh, we're not dilettantes. No, I know. We, we are business people. <laughs> and it is true that if you find an idea that requires three or four years of improvement and patience and really sticking with it, uh, that we're very good at that. Take Windows, which we bet our company on. Everybody doubted that would succeed. IBM did not support us in that. Uh, it took longer than we expected, uh, over four years before finally graphical interface got popular. And now people take it for granted. It's part of every personal computer and you just you just expect it to be there. That was one of the grand successes of the company. In the same way, we're betting on the internet, that our tools there will be popular, and that a few of these content plays that we've decided to get involved in, that the scale and, and the users will make those into great businesses. We also are big believers in, in United Way and, and what goes on there, and that's more at a business level. We sort of think every business ought to do that as a basic thing, because social services uh, we think have a, a per, deserve particular priority in terms of drawing employees in to to help help the community. And there's ways to take those fundraising things within a company and have contests and comparisons and great stories. Get the word out. Make it fun. Make it easy. You know, it's just a piece of email. The easiest thing to do is click and say you want to give your fair share, and then we send you no more email. Uh, so <laughs> we've made it the easiest thing to do is is uh, is participate. In terms of individuals, it's quite different. You know, you can take and give to groups like United Way who are really thinking about everything in the community, or you can find things, and most people mix this, you can find things that you're particularly interested in, that you know about, that a relative benefited from, or that you want to go and volunteer in. Uh, you know, Microsoft does a thing now for every hour that somebody volunteers, we actually uh, make a grant to that organization, because that says that they're they care about it, and uh, they think it's, it's doing very good work. Now, for individuals at some levels, probably most your giving is going to be in the community where you know what's going on. I'm a big believer that, that the, some of the greatest inequities are on a global basis. And so uh, one of the things our foundation tries to get out is the names of a number of organizations like Save the Children or Global Fund or Vaccine Fund that we know are taking dollars in a very efficient way and saving lives and improving conditions. And you know, I would hope that as people are able to be fairly generous, that this international component, that it be part of, of what they're doing. Obviously, if you get up to enough scale, then you can uh, take on big projects. And I will get a chance with some of my extra time to go out and, and share with people who are uh, lucky enough to have wealth and just tell them how much fun I'm having and that it can have impact and you know, hopefully encourage it. I, I think when Warren Buffett gave, gave his gift, it sent a message to people that, wow, uh, you know, we got, we, we, this is the, the right thing to do and you know, he, he doesn't like to waste money. Uh, so you know, a sense that there are causes out there that you can make a big difference with. There's no doubt that uh, you know, creating a board, having people like Dave Marquardt there who wasn't at the company, you know, and we were so overwrought about, you know, this is right, this is wrong, we messed this up, 
that having people have a little bit of distance uh, come in and talk to us is good. You know, for the last uh, oh, 30 years or so, I've gotten to be friends with Warren Buffett. And he, he's in Omaha, uh, he's not in this tech world at all. You know, and to <laughs> him, it's like, hey, how could you ever know which will rise and which will fall? I'm not going to put money uh, <laughs> until Apple sold at a multiple of 12. Then uh, <laughs> he decided he could put 50 billion into that. Uh, <laughs> after he asked all his friends, hey, you know, if, they, if somebody had an uh, iPhone that was half as expensive, would you switch away? You know, or is it more like jewelry, where you really want uh, to, to have an iPhone? And so he decided that the, those profit streams might not be eliminated anytime soon. Anyway, he, because he's not in this world, he has a, a, a definite way of looking at things, including this idea of how uh, work should be fun. He has made his work so much fun that he works more hours than I do. He works six days a week at 88 years old. And he likes to say that he skips to work every day. He, he doesn't, but uh, he says that. <laughs> uh, visual. He, when he was 83, he could still skip, but now he's gotten <laughs> really, he can't do it. Uh, so uh, having somebody like that, you know, the toughest thing I went through was this antitrust lawsuit yeah. where, you know, it didn't seem uh, very predictable. Uh, and he was a great counsel during all of that stuff. So getting somebody who's in, successful in another domain, uh, uh, but yet kind of a business uh, type mindset. Anyway, for me, that, that was a huge gift. I think it's important that we build that feedback system. Now exactly how you do that, how much you connect that up to the pay system, uh, you know, we need experimentation, and we can look at these other countries that have done it. There is a move afoot to do some of this, but whether the investment levels be enough to make it high quality, and whether the, um, there'll be kind of high stakes that overuse the test scores uh, for this stuff and, and will sort of hurt its reputation, it's hard to say at this point. But I'd say it's uh, giving more feedback to teachers would be the very first thing uh, that would get us back up to, the, uh, to being one of the best in the world. If you want to have impact, uh, usually delegation's important. Uh, although, you know, individual contributors in terms of inventing a drug or a new approach to things, that's phenomenal. So when Microsoft first got started, I wrote most of the code, and everybody else's code I read and kind of rewrote. Uh, and <laughs> that got us up to 10 people. And then I had to say to myself, OK, we're going to ship code that I didn't edit. Uh, and that was hard for me. Uh, but I, you know, I kind of got over that. Then I still said, OK, I'm going to interview everyone. And I'm going to at least look at samples of their code. Well, that got us up to about 40 people. And that was at a point where I had sold way more software than we could write, uh, because everybody was so impressed. And I thought, well, I need to keep enough, collect enough money to you know, keep hiring all these people. But uh, the demand was so high that you know, we were actually falling behind. That's when I hired Steve. And Steve figured out, A, uh, how to control what promises I made to people, uh, and B, how to hire lots of people, and good, really good people, and create organizations and teams. So I delegated to Steve that. And he was constantly saying to me, OK, we're going to hire programmers that you've never met. And I'd say, no, we're not. And then he, he would show me numerically that the constraint wasn't going to work. Uh, you know, so uh, then I said, OK. Then I would you know, know all the managers of the people. And so over time, uh, and of course, you know, I could say the quality per person was falling monotonically, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, according to me. Uh, but you know, large problems, uh, if you want to you know, write the most popular uh, office productivity software, that one person absolutely can't do that. You can write pretty code. So everyone has to decide what scale of organization they want to work in. Eventually, you know, my role was very much as a leader and a reviewer of managers. But the top people, and I hired some super experienced people, uh, I would make sure they were pursuing a common vision and they were well coordinated. But in terms of a lot of management stuff, they were way better 
than I was. Now I had to have the framework to know what mix of skills that we needed and you know when they were working well enough together. But a lot of uh, you know my value add of was picking say to do graphics user interface or to do an integrated office uh, type thing or to go global and not use agents to have Microsoft be present all over the world. And so yeah, picking what you're good at and how you find the other people uh, to fill in those things, that's super important. And most founders don't, aren't able to scale that up and kind of give up the hands-on things that they used to get a lot of uh, pleasure and comfort from. Urgency that I felt that if we didn't get Microsoft going right away, that somebody uh, would do a great job building a software company, we won't have a chance. That probably ended up not being true, that I could have waited two or three years and the opportunity to do Microsoft still would be there. But anyway, I felt a sense of urgency. Uh, and you know, it's not like you know, I still get to take courses and learn things um, today, you know, things like the learning company and there's all sorts of right. great books. So it's not like I've missed some part of my education. Right. When you dropped out, your father and mother said, are you sure you know what you want to do? If one of your children dropped out of college to start a company, what would you say? Well, I'd have to say yes, but uh, <laughs> the dropping out is not an irrevocable decision. Uh, right. You know, if you try and start a company that doesn't go well, they always let you go back. Right. Uh, and so if you don't have, you know, kids that you need to uh, support, you know, it's a very low risk thing, particularly in the culture of the United States where trying to start something and, and failing is not a black mark for the rest of your life. So when you were starting Microsoft, there were a lot of other software companies and you were not number one at the beginning. I think there were others who were a little bit further ahead. What was it that enabled you to beat everybody else up in the software business? Was it Bill Gates? Was it something else? What was the unique factor that made you the most successful? Yeah, we were actually the first. And, but there were companies, uh, and they were all kind of single product companies, who got ahead of us uh, in terms of sales. Uh, you know, by uh, about 1991, uh, we, we did become the largest uh, of all of them. We were an engineering company. We were about how you hire smart people and how you use tools to develop software broadly. We were global and we weren't about a single product. So like, for example, WordPerfect was a word processor, somebody might remember. Uh, they did so well with that product that their gross sales rivaled ours when we were doing a broad set of products. As soon as graphics interface caught on, which was Windows uh, that became mainstream in 1995, we became far larger than the other right. software companies. Now, subsequently, uh, you know, Google, Apple, uh, Amazon have become, uh, you know, also extremely right. successful. But in the 90s, we were the strongest uh, okay. by far. There's no doubt that the antitrust lawsuit was bad for Microsoft, and it, it, we would have been more focused on creating the uh, phone operating system, and so instead of using Android today, you would be using Windows Mobile. If it hadn't been for the antitrust case, uh, Microsoft would have gone, oh, we were so close. We, we, you know, I was just too distracted. I screwed that up uh, because of the distraction. And you know, we were just three months too late with the release that Motorola would have used on a phone. Uh, so yes, uh, it's a winner-take-all game, that right. is for sure, that you know, now nobody here has ever heard of Windows Mobile. Uh, but oh well, and I wouldn't, uh, well, that's a few hundred billion here or there. Uh, I wouldn't have retired as soon, and that one is less, you know, I am disappointed that Windows Mobile didn't succeed, but in terms of uh, my own life, you know, even though it was a very painful thing because I got very personally involved in the defense of the company, the fact that I retired earlier probably net was good for me because I got down the learning curve on the foundation. I got to right. partner with Melinda in the early days of the foundation. And you know, I don't have a life where I'm allowed to complain uh, because basically you know, only 99% of things have worked out very, very well. The idea that you could get people to, to decide to support this foreign aid thing, which is a big deal 
for our foundation from a numeric point of view. We're still pushing that a little bit, but honestly, the story of the one child, you know, if you say to an audience, here's the picture of this child, shall we save this child? They're more engaged than if you said, hey, let's save a million children. You know, so there's definitely a sort of, you know, 10 to the 6 problem uh, here somewhere. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> that fascinating. Humans are not wired uh, to be, to do that on a numeric basis. Um, and so, you know, that's why we have people like Bono and, and many others who come from a more storytelling world. Yeah. And then they let me throw a few charts and numbers in just uh, <laughs> because I think uh, that that should, should be there. Once your heart tells you what direction to go in to prove that this is a, a very affordable, not, you know, not a big deal, well-managed path to, to be on. If you were uh, 20 years old today and you wanted to start a new company, drop out of Harvard, what company or what area would you want to start it in? Well, this is a... a great time to be doing innovation because the tools of innovation are so much better. There are lots of things in biology that are very interesting. Uh, there are lots of things in energy that are interesting. Given my background, I would start an AI company that, uh, whose goal would be to uh, teach computers how to read so that they can absorb and understand all the written knowledge of the world. That's an area where AI has yet to make progress, and it will be quite profound when we achieve that goal. Most people over the last 200 years or so, whoever they, the wealthiest person in the world was, didn't usually work that hard when they got to be 60 or so. They kind of took life easy. You seem to be working pretty hard. What motivates you to still work so hard? Well, I love my work. The work of the foundation is super interesting. I get to meet with the scientists. I get to go out in the field. I do think your habits are sort of set in your 20s and 30s. And by my standards of the 20s, you know, I didn't believe in weekends back then, uh, not to mention vacations. So I'm you know, fairly lazy compared to myself in my 20s, where I was a true uh, fanatic. Uh, you know, all I believed in was working on software night and day. And, and for my 20s, that was perfect. I didn't have a wife or family uh, at all. And my role was very hand, hands-on role. You know, I, I'm very lucky that my foundation work, the part-time work I do for Microsoft, I see that extending you know, for decades into the future. And having an understanding of innovation, uh, you know, I think shaping innovation in many of these areas, uh, there is a unique role that I can, right. I can help play. I like to look at numbers a lot. And so when I look at the numbers, I'm just amazed, whether it's the quality of the inner city education, the dropout rates. Oprah did a thing where she had kids from an inner city school go look at the suburban school and vice versa. And they were just stunned that the building and everything was so completely different. So I think, you know, even for me, I have to go, you know, whether it's the inner city in America, talking to people who live there, or outside the US, we have this same thing, you know, the situation in Africa, you know, it's overwhelmingly uh, black population, is so much worse than people are probably aware of. And so hands-on visits, whether it's to the schools or the clinics, I think that is necessary to hear the voices of people who've been hurt. And then, you know, there's a lot of good movies now. There's a lot of good books. I was just reading the new Jim Crow, which is pretty eloquent and forceful about the justice system and the role that it plays in perpetuating bad conditions. And you know, it takes a lot to try and put yourself having empathy for other people. So we all have to push harder on this. I get to, when I, you know, say, okay, we're going to build a TB drug team. We're going to build the TB vaccine team. We're going to build a, uh, you know, kill all the mosquitoes in the world, gene drive, CRISPR team. Uh, <laughs> I get to, in terms of how we fund that, organize it, how many locations do we wait till they have this result before we scale it up? I get to use the same, uh, or 80% the same uh, <laughs> type of thinking that I exercised in terms of, okay, let's go do Windows, let's go do Excel. Uh, so it's backing engineers, it's getting a sense of the team, you know, what needs to be added to that team or the IQs on the team adding up uh, as opposed to subtracting from each other. And it's very comfortable because the, the most intense period of 
of Microsoft was where these teams were about size 30. And for our diseases, you know, typhoid, rotavirus, there's a lot of diseases uh, <laughs> that hopefully you'll never hear of again, uh, most of which don't exist here in the US. But uh, yeah. so it is very, very similar. It takes a decade generally from start to finish. The AIDS vaccine actually were on year 14 and uh, it'll probably be another eight to 10 years before that one is completely done. So some take as long as, as 20 years uh, because there's many dead ends and you have kind of a, a portfolio of approaches. But yes, I feel like my working with governments, hiring smart people, uh, managing teams, it did prepare me well for this very operational uh, organization that's a lot like a business except that we're, our profit is live saved as opposed to uh, a monetary measure. Certainly during the time I was at Harvard, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Uh, the idea that software was this field that uh, was the opportunity was unbelievable. That became more obvious during the three year period I was here. Uh, but my dad had been a lawyer. I thought of mathematics, you know, like doing well in the Putnam. That was the coolest thing. Uh, and the computer software, I didn't think those people were as smart as the math people. So it's like, well, am I going to go into the easy field uh, or this really hard field? But uh, anyway, math uh, was fantastic. When I finally picked and decided to go, go to Microsoft, then I got into a period from age uh, 19 uh, to about 40 where I wasn't able to look at the latest on you know, how tornadoes work or how mitochondria work. I was pretty monomaniacal. And when I was able to ask Steve, this is the year 2000, Steve Ballmer, uh, he, he mistakenly graduated, uh, but then he started at Stan... Uh, <laughs> but I was trying to hire him, but his parents told him you're supposed to graduate, which was fine. But then... He started at Stanford Business School, and he was in his first year, and I thought, oh, this is perfect. I'll get him to drop out of Stanford Business School. Uh, so in a certain sense, he is a dropout. Uh, uh, and he was very key to the success of Microsoft. I mean, uh, he knew a lot of things. But during that period, I didn't get to do much. At Harvard, you know, I took all these courses because it was just so amazing that people were interested in talking about them. And uh, I... I have to say, I never went to a lecture during reading period or any, anything because the courses that I was actually signed up for, I finally started to work on those. Uh, so I was in Hillel, the minute would open to the minute it would close during reading period, trying to catch up on, on that other set of courses. So people say I'm a dropout, which is literally true, but <laughs> because I like college courses, the online college courses. There's a company called The Learning Company that I buy uh, tons and tons of their stuff. And I do you know, at least four or five courses a year. In a sense, I like uh, going to college more than anyone. Uh, so <laughs> you know, I've sort of made sure my job, certainly post Microsoft, uh, that I get to spend my time meeting with scientists, uh, learning new things, you know, seeing what the hard problems are, in some cases giving money to people to take on uh, those very, very hard problems. I decided to, to focus more on uh, giving away than, than making money. And so I've uh, gotten a chance to travel the world, be out in Africa and Asia quite a bit and see the needs that are out there. And now our foundation is very focused on global health, uh, focused on agriculture because the majority of the, the very poor in the world are farmers who have very small plots of land. So any increase in productivity or certainty of their crop coming in uh, can make huge difference for them. And you might think of a career in software, you know, selling to uh, people who can afford personal computers, and now uh, the career at the foundation is being very different. And certainly they're different in the sense that now it's about vaccines. Now a lot it's, it's with various uh, governments, uh, the donor governments, the governments in, in poor countries. But at its core, it's really basically the same thing, which is uh, finding innovators, uh, people who've got breakthrough ideas, uh, be willing to back them, understand what they're working on, 
uh, measure uh, what they're coming up with, uh, try and make sure that when it's delivered, it really has the impact it's supposed to be, and getting into a feedback loop driven by uh, very precise measurement. First time I met Warren, uh, we were talking about getting together and doing uh, something again, and he pulled out his calendar, and the pages were so blank. Uh, and I said, wow, you know, you've managed to avoid getting tied in to a lot of kind of meaningless activity. And you know, Warren said, yeah, you have to be good at saying no uh, and picking the things that, that really make a difference. And that's one of many things I've learned from Warren, but that's one of my favorites. And uh, so I can blame it on him whenever I'm uh, turning things down. The nice thing now that I'm not uh, so extreme, in my 20s, I, I didn't get to read uh, much at all. Yeah. And so like all this stuff is going on in biology and math, um, I just didn't, didn't get to read it. Then when I did get into my 30s, those vacations were uh, <laughs> a time to go back. Uh, because when I was a student, you know, you could study all sorts of things. Uh, anyway, um, now, you know, I read a lot of science uh, and that uses up, uh, you know, maybe half of the slots yeah. uh, that, that I have. Really understanding U.S. poverty and what's going on there. There's a, a few dozen books that try and give you a glimpse of that that are very good. This book, Factfulness, let me say, you know, it definitely uh, creates a framing uh, for what's going on in the world. And the other one that's right up there is any uh, pinker book, starting with uh, uh, Better Angels of Our Nature. I think success is always a bit dangerous. Uh, you know, and, and you can think that whatever your success was, was because you, know, you are magically uh, uh, gifted in understanding things. Whereas, of course, any success, particularly a gigantic success, is a huge number of factors, including hard work and understanding, but timing, you know, other people who came to work with you, other people who might have done the same thing who somehow messed up uh, in doing it. And so often you'll, you'll have too much confidence about what you understand. Uh, you know, in science, uh, as Feynman said, the easiest person to fool is yourself. Uh, and so you have to force yourself to go through uh, you know, again and again and think through, is this the right thing to be doing? You know, will this work? Am I doing it because it would be exciting if it succeeded? Am I really looking at these factors? In fact, in polio, several times we had to say to ourselves, was it time to give up? Uh, or really did we think there was a prospect of uh, being able to move forward? Do you have any regrets in your life? You seem to have a life that most people would love to live. You've got a happy family, great marriage foundation, business success, is there anything, can you make us feel good by saying you've done something that didn't work out or just make us, because all of us feel bad because we look at you and we can't do what you've done. So tell us something that's bad that you've done or you'd feel inadequate about. Something, there must be something. No, I am super lucky. Uh, you know, they marrying Melinda, uh, the experience at Microsoft, uh, that although it had its ups and downs was uh, phenomenal. Uh, the work of the foundation, and... No regrets about anything. I wouldn't try and go back and change anything. I mean, for example, the antitrust lawsuit against Microsoft, you know, was bad for the company. It created a lot of distraction. We would have done a lot of things, including the mobile operating system, better if it hadn't been for that. But in a way, it was a lesson for me, uh, and... You know, so it, and it probably accelerated my retirement uh, by five or six years, which overall for me probably was a, a good thing. Um, you know, I don't think it was a principled right. set of activities, but that's another story. So today, the greatest pleasure of your life is when you're doing what? Is it other than being interviewed by me or something like that? What is the great, greatest pleasure of your life? Uh, you know, time with kids, Time with scientists, uh, time when I'm reading and things are making sense, um, you know, going out and seeing the impact of the foundation's work, uh, meeting with scientists who think we can make breakthroughs to uh, help solve climate. Uh, you know, these are super interesting problems. And, you know, having a broad set of system thinking applied to these problems 
is going to be necessary uh, to orchestrate the resources and policies behind them. So, you know, I love, I love my work. The key thing was that Paul, Alan, and I had loved working on software since we were lucky enough to be exposed. Literally, I was uh, 13 in eighth grade when this timesharing terminal came in, and we just did it day and night and, you know, got better. And we could see that the magic of software combined with this miracle of the microprocessor subject to Moore's law exponential improvement, that that was a magic combination. And we'd, we'd look around and say, hey, how come everybody's not saying this is amazing? I mean, we're going to dethrone IBM. And, uh, you know, why doesn't digital equipment get it? Why is the guy who runs it? This is a company that's long gone, uh, but dominated many computers at the time. Why isn't that guy up there saying it's, it's wrong? We know it's right. And so the key event for us was it was a very cold Boston winter. And a kit computer came out on uh, this popular electronics magazine, and we said, oh, damn, this is happening without us. I mean, here we are uh, doing nothing. And so we called the company <laughs> up and said, you know, hey, we're ready. Uh, and then we called them back. We actually did the work, and then we called them back and said, how do you make the stuff go in and out of the computer, the I.O.? And they said, well, that's interesting. Nobody else has ever asked that. You must really be doing something. So that was... Anyway, our very first customer. And so we grabbed on to it to be the very first. And we were the first to say there should be a software industry and, and come and do it. In a sense, it was one of the lower risk things I've ever done in my life because you know, I could have always gone back. Uh, you know, well, my parents, my dad didn't say, hey, if you go away for a few years, I'll stop paying for your education. They were nice and said, OK, go. You know, learn your lesson down there in the desert, and uh, <laughs> and you get back to the serious stuff. And you know, we're still we're still waiting. If you want to learn computer science, just you know, Knuth wrote the book. Buy it, okay? Uh, you know, read it and do the problems for if you really think you know this thing. If you want to learn physics, Feynman wrote the book. Uh, just read the damn book. It's all there. So that when we put stuff online. It, we don't have anything in online physics that's any better than Feynman's book, honest, honestly. Now, it's a little easier to learn. Uh, you know, the guy makes jokes every 20 minutes, or at least tries to, uh, <laughs> and he does more demos and things. So learning is a weird social phenomenon. And so, you know, our foundation, our big problem is that the group that does the worst with online learning are low-income students because their notion of why am I learning, their sense of self-confidence, the ability to figure out, oh, I just got stuck because you know, two minuses cancel out, and I, I never saw that notation before. They just hit dead ends all the time that if you're sitting in your dorm at Stanford, you know, somebody walks down and uh, helps you get through it. I feel like you always seem to swing for the fences in general. It's just sort of a new way of framing it. But I have to ask, if you are swinging for the fences, what if you miss? Well, hopefully uh, you get more than one swing. Is that fair? <laughs> yeah. uh, either at the same problem, like you know, multiple malaria vaccine constructs, so right. that you know, if you have two or three, the combined chance of success is much higher, or that you're working in multiple areas, not just one area. Right. You know, in climate, for example, I have a company that's uh, trying to make a nuclear reactor that would be very cheap and that would have safety so that the public would be very accepting of it. Yeah. Now, you know, even I realize that's high risk, you know, less than 50% chance all that comes together. And yet, uh, it, if it did, and the only reason I'm involved is it would really help with climate, uh, let us generate electricity without any greenhouse gases. When I started Microsoft, I didn't think of it as all that risky. I mean, I was so excited about what we were doing. It's true I could have gone bankrupt, uh, but you know, I had a set of skills that were highly employable. And in fact, my parents were still willing to let me go back to Harvard and finish my education if I wanted to. You've always got a job with Mayville. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the only the thing that was scary to me wasn't quitting and starting the company. It was when I started hiring my friends, and they expected to be paid. Uh, <laughs> and, and then we had customers who went bankrupt, customers that I'd counted on to come through. And so then I, I got this incredibly conservative approach that I wanted to have enough money in the bank to pay a year's worth of payroll 
uh, even if we didn't get any any payments coming in. And you know, I'm almost uh, <laughs> true to that the whole time. We have about 10 billion now, which is, is pretty much enough yeah. for the next year. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, you know, I, if you're going to start a company, it takes so much energy that you, know, you it better overcome your, your feeling of risk. I don't think that you necessarily, if you're going to start a company, you should do it at the start of your career. I think there's a lot to be said for working for a company, learning how they do things. You know, if you're young, it's hard to go lease premises. They, they made that hard for me. You couldn't rent a car uh, when you were uh, uh, under 25 at the time, so I was always taking taxis to go see customers. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the people would, you know, people would say, well, we're going to go have a discussion in the bar. Well, I couldn't go to the bar. <laughs> And, but you know, that's fun because I'll tell you, when people are first skeptical and they think, oh, this kid doesn't know anything, then when you show them you've really got a good product and you know something, they actually tend to go overboard and they think, whoa, you know, they know a lot. Uh, let's really do an incredible amount with these people. So our youth, at least in this country, uh, was a, a huge asset for us once we reached a, a certain threshold. It is hard, it's hard to hire old, older people. Um, because they'll be a little bit conservative about whether they should come and, and take the risk. And it took three or four years before we could go out into the normal sort of employment pool. But those, those problems that come with starting a firm, you better think of those as, as part of the, the pleasure, part of the, the, the challenge that, that is part of the, the excitement. Throughout our history, we wake every day knowing that in the business of technology, uh, you have to think about what are you missing? What is the research or customer feedback that you should be paying more attention to? And how do you keep that pace of innovation very, very high? How do you make sure you're hiring the very best people? And that kind of focus has is, is helped drive us forward through all the milestones the company has had. Uh, certainly the internet is, is a great example of that. We had to uh, tear up our, uh, our plans and, and step back and say, well, how do, we, how do we really embrace all that's good about the internet and recognize some of the shortcomings and make sure we're leading the way in uh, reducing what, what have, has held people away from the internet? Computers, when I was young, were super expensive. And my friend Paul Allen and I actually snuck into places at the University of Washington where they had computers that weren't being used at night. And so we were fascinated by what the computer could do, but very few people were getting exposure. We had to go out of our way, and we were lucky that we did it all. And so then when the idea of moving the computer onto a chip that Intel would make, and that would make the computer literally millions of times cheaper than the ones we were using, so both more powerful and available to people on a personal level, then the idea of, OK, it would be very different. The software you needed, the way the industry would work, we were super lucky to uh, be there when that was happening. So what did your family think? Did they say, there's something wrong with this young man? He wants to just do computers? They knew I was obsessed with computers, that I would skip athletics, that I'd go in overnight, that I'd you know, leave the house sometimes when they prefer I wouldn't go work at night on these things. And so it was kind of considered a little strange and the big moment was when I said, instead of going to part of my senior year, that I wanted to go work uh, for a company writing software. So they were great about allowing that to be my hobby. So you went to Harvard and you dropped out. Have you ever thought how your life could be better off if you had gotten your Harvard degree? Well, I, I'm a weird dropout because I take college courses all the time. I love... Uh, learning company courses and, and things. So I loved being a student. And there were smart people around, and you, you know, they fed you, and they gave you these nice grades that made you feel smart. Uh, so I, I feel it was unfortunate uh, that I didn't get to stay there. But I don't think I missed any knowledge, because you know, whatever I needed to learn, I, would, I was still in a, a learning mode. So you are here with your daughter, who is 21, right? And you were 21 when you became a billionaire. Is that right? Almost, yep. All right, so ar around that age. You were, you were like the youngest person to become a billionaire. Is that right? 
For, yeah. Yeah, in terms of my own, earning it on my own, yeah. Right. Okay, so, well, it's just the most important thing, yeah. <laughs> so, did you, when you were a kid, did you, did you care about money, or you just cared about technology, and that's, it just happened? Uh, mostly, I love software. Uh, I do remember at the private school I went to, there were other kids whose families were better off, like they had a Porsche or something, but it wasn't that that big of a deal. My thing was that I just loved doing software, I loved hiring people, and I was stunned when it ended up being so valuable. Really? Yeah. You, that surprised you? <laughs> yeah, because I always had to be careful that we wouldn't hire too many people. I was always worried because I was people who worked for me were older than me and they had kids. And I always thought, well, what if we don't get paid? Will I be able to meet the payroll? So I was always very conservative about the finances. And then when we did go uh, public, uh, what was I? Uh, 30 by then, uh, then I was kind of stunned at what it multiplied out to. Education is essentially a social construct. It's not that the universities have secret knowledge that only they have available. Uh, you know, I took, <laughs> these numbers won't make any sense anymore, but the hardest freshman math class was called Math 55. Uh, <laughs> I assume it's not called that anymore, uh, but it was, it was a group of eight, uh, uh, it was a group of 80 people whose personal positioning was they were the best person at math that they had ever met. So there were 79 frauds, uh, one person who really was the, the best at math. I ended up, the guy who came in first in the class is a lawyer in New York now. Uh, the guy who came in second is a professor of chaos theory at uh, Princeton. Uh, and then I came in third. Uh, so I knew, okay, math, geez, uh, that's interesting. Anyway, uh, I didn't take Physics uh, 55, but I read the Feynman book. And so if you're motivated, seriously, you don't have to take a course. The Feynman book, if you're hardcore, just read the Feynman book, do the problems. You want to learn to do software? Read The Art of Computer pro Programming. Good luck doing the problems, but uh, you know, anyone that's rated 30 or harder is like super hard to do. And so a MOOC, in a sense, doesn't change what counts. Uh, you know, it's always been in the textbook, but the percentage of students who just buy textbooks and, and read them and know the subject is vanishingly small. You kind of have to have this thing where a bunch of kids all come at the same time. Uh, and you know, if you don't study, you're gonna get a bad grade and your parents may not like that. Uh, you have to create all these social things in order for people to get into this mode of hyper-concentrating and actually understanding why should I concentrate? You know, if I'm a high school student, they put X's and Y's up on the board. How does that relate to my life? Now, if you understood that being good at math lets you get a good job, travel the world, uh, you might say, okay, it does relate to me, but that's a very indirect thing, and the kind of discipline to care about that, uh, to concentrate, that's what's missing. And so MOOCs, to the degree that it's easier to take a MOOC than it is to read a textbook, yeah, that's nice. It's a little bit interactive, there's a video. That's partly why I like the learning company, like all their economics, there's a guy named Timothy Taylor who has five courses on economics, I super recommend. Uh, and you learn to like him and his way of explaining things. So a MOOC is a slightly more digestible form of learning, but it doesn't take, particularly for somebody at a young age, it in no way changes this question of why should people uh, engage in that learning and how do you create the environment and the sense of achievement and the sense of capability that sitting in there and you know, looking at X's and Y's and manipulating them uh, seems like a, a smart thing to do. Let's say you're interviewing for a junior engineer position at Microsoft. Sitting in a boardroom or on video call uh, in 2020, why should we hire you? You should look at the code that I've written. You know, I'm kind of crazy. I write software programs way beyond any classes that I've taken and think I've gotten better over time. So take a look at how ambitious I've been there. I do think I can work well with people. I might criticize their code a little harshly, but overall, I like to be on a team. I like ambitious goals. I like thinking through how we can anticipate the future. Software is cool and I wanna be involved. How would you define your strengths and your weaknesses? How you can you know, incorporate those into a team kind of aspect? Well, I'm not 
somebody who knows a lot about marketing, you know, I wouldn't enjoy being a salesman. For a position where you're actually creating the products and thinking through what those features should be, I'm fascinated by that. I followed the history of the industry, read about the mistakes that have been made. So product definition, product creation, very strong. If you have a team that understands the customers, the sales, the marketing. I'm not gonna bring that, but I, I would enjoy working with them. When you have a tragedy like this pandemic, there is always the possibility you're going to narrow your community that you care about. You're gonna think about yourself or your family, not the whole country, including those who've been, been somewhat left behind. Likewise, there's a risk looking at Africa and other developing countries and saying, no, we need to help them out because difficulties there of not enough food are, are really extreme and small amounts of the budget, less than 1% can help them out. Likewise, you don't wanna just think about the here and now, you also wanna think about the future. After all, the government failed us by not anticipating this pandemic. There were voices like mine in uh, TED Talk and other venues that kind of said, hey, get ready. We don't know when, but it's coming. Sadly, that didn't happen. Another thing we trust government to get us ready for is climate change. That's coming and it won't be as easy as creating a vaccine to solve it. And so right now, in terms of people's sympathy being broad, you know, being willing to address other problems, even though they're not here right now, I am actually seeing a lot of positive voices. People saying, make sure the recovery is a green recovery. Europe has done a lot on that. And so, and actually the dialogue in politics about, you know, does climate change matter is stronger today than it's ever been. So this closing in and only worrying about the short term, I'm not seeing that. Of course, your audience, which is very young, will be the key to saying, Let's not just look at this short term. Let's start the investments that deal with inequities. Let's start the investments that can make sure climate change doesn't come in and, and have even more tragic results than this pandemic does. Young people thinking about policies, getting involved. I think I'm seeing an uptick. I hope that's sustained because they're, you know, they're the ones who will really do the innovative work. If you want another amazing Bill Gates video, check it out right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there.